This is lecture nine, regression diagnostics. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to know how to identify and address heteroscopastic errors in regression, know how to identify and deal with multicollinearity in regression, and know how to identify and deal with autocorrelation in regression. In this lecture, I'm going to teach you some simple techniques to troubleshoot possible problems you can run into when you are running a regression analysis. Imagine you ran a regression and the results of the analysis were, were not what you expected. Perhaps the results for the significance test for the coefficient were insignificant. Perhaps the coefficient was significant, but substantively the coefficient was small, so it appeared that the independent variable had a small impact on the dependent variable. For example, imagine you ran a regression with ratio level independent and dependent variables that both range from 0 to 10. If the coefficient was 0.01, that would mean that a one unit change in the independent variable would only lead to a 0.01 unit change in the dependent variable. In other words, a large change in the independent variable would only lead to a small change in the dependent variable. Another problem you could run into it when you are running a regression is that the coefficient turns out to be in the wrong direction and significant in that direction. The unexpected result of a regression analysis could mean that the independent variable does not have a true impact or a true strong impact on the dependent variable. Alternatively, it may still have the impact we expect, but we need to, we need to make improvements to our regression model in order to properly determine whether that impact exists. Throughout this lecture, I will show you simple techniques to build better regression models so that you can rule out some mathematical reasons the regression the regression model produced the results it did. Recall that the equation for a regression equation is dependent variable hat equals b hat times the independent variable plus a hat plus e hat. Remember that e hat equals the actual value of our dependent variable for an individual observation minus the estimate of our dependent variable for that observation based on the regression equation. Now, after calculating all of our errors for a particular regression model, if we take the mean of those errors, the average should be zero. Why? Because our regression model assumes we perfectly estimate our dependent variable on average. Now, our regression models will overestimate and underestimate particular observations, but all of those overestimations and underestimations will cancel each other out, leaving to an average error of zero. What is very important to note, however, is that even though the math always works out and we always get an average error of zero, we shouldn't necessarily be confident in our results. When we use ordinary least squares regression, the regression model assumes that we have included every single relevant independent variable in our model. And as a result, that all of our independent variables collectively help us perfectly predict our dependent variable. And if our model makes an error in predicting, we assume that error is random. Something happened for a particular observation that was a random event that changed the value of the dependent or independent variable. For example, let's say we're running a model using survey data where we use party identification as the dependent variable and income as the independent variable. For one particular observation, the survey respondent accidentally chose the wrong answer for their income because they took the survey too quickly. For that particular observation, the model might incorrectly predict that respondent's party identification because they gave the wrong information about their income. That is a random error. It is not something that happens to every respondent. Regression allows for this random error to exist. Of course, we never have perfect models. We never have every single independent variable in our models. As a result, our errors are not random. Our errors become predictable for certain observations. This leads us to the second assumption of regression, homoscedasticity. This means that we assume the variance of the error term is the same across all values of our independent variables. To illustrate what it means when the errors in a model are homoscedastic, consider this example. Imagine your dependent variable was party identification and your independent variable was income. You run a regression model. 
If the errors were homoscedastic, the variance of the error term would be, this, be the same across all values of income. In other words, the model is likely to generate similar er errors across all values of income. Stated another way, we could say that the errors in income are not correlated. We cannot predict the errors based on income. Additionally, if the errors are not correlated with the independent variable income, that would mean they, they would also theoretically not be correlated with the dependent variable party identification. Since the model would consistently make estimates of the dependent variable party identification across all values of the independent variable income, the errors would also not be correlated with the dependent variable either. Often our regression models violate homoscedasticity. When we violate homoscedasticity, we call it heteroscedasticity. This just means the variance of the error term is not the same across all values of our independent variable. Substantively, this means that our model estimates our dependent variable better at some values of our independent variable and worse at other values of our independent variable. As a result, the variance of the errors is not the same across all values of the dependent variable. The model may predict the dependent variable well at lower, lower levels of the dependent variable, but not at higher levels, or vice versa. For example, imagine we ran a model where education was the independent variable and income was the dependent variable. It, is, it could be possible that at lower levels of education, ed, education predicts income well, as in predicts individuals will have low income. But at higher levels of education, education has a harder time predicting income. Sometimes individuals have middle class income and sometimes upper class income. This would lead to a larger variance in the errors at higher levels of education and income. Heteroscedasticity is a problem. We don't want it in our regression models. While the estimates of our coefficients b hat should be close to predicting the true coefficients b that exist in the real world between our independent and dependent variables, our model would be inefficient. Our estimates would be less precise, meaning our error would be larger, and if our error would be larger, we would be less likely to get significant results and our r squared would be reduced. In order to determine whether our errors are heteroscedastic, we can use graphical methods in SPSS. First, note that if the standardized errors or errors that are transformed into z-scores, which are a lot like t-scores, of our regression models are homoscedastic, they should be normally distributed around zero, as in the most common error value is about zero. And recall that with a normal curve, 68% of the observations are one standard unit from the mean, 95% are within two standard units, and 99.7 are within three standard units of the mean. If the errors are not normally distributed around zero, that means the model is making large errors and the errors are heteroscedastic. To show you how to determine whether errors are homoscedastic or heteroscedastic in regression models in SPSS, I will use the following example. Assume that democracy scores the dependent variable and GDP per capita is the independent variable. The hypothesis is, as GDP per capita increases, democracy score increases. To run the regression in SPSS, while also including heteroscedasticity tests, you click Analyze Regression Linear. You put the dependent variable in the dependent box. You put the independent variables in the independent box. Then you select Plots, Histogram. Then move the star Z R E S I D to the Y box. These are the standardized errors. And star Z P R E D to the X box. These are the standardized estimates. Then click Continue and OK. Once it is done, scroll down to the histogram. 
This is the histogram of the standardized errors. If the errors look normally distributed, like a bell that is symmetric on both sides with a mean of zero, like this, then the errors are homoscedastic. If the errors do not look normally distributed, the errors are likely heteroscedastic. These errors do not look normally distributed around zero. The shape of this graph does not look like a bell curve with the highest peak at zero. Instead, the highest peak is around 1.5, and the histogram appears to have a negative skew with a handful of observation pulling the distribution in a negative direction. After you are done examining the histogram, scroll down to scatter plot. On the scatter plot, the x-axis represents the standardized, standardized estimates of the dependent variable. The y-axis represents the standardized errors. If the errors are homoscedastic, there should be no relationship between the standardized estimates and standardized errors. In other words, if we drew a line in the middle of these points, the slope of the line would be zero. If the errors are heteroscedastic, there would be a positive or negative relationship between the estimates and standardized errors. In other words, if we drew a line through the middle of these points, the slope of the line would be greater than zero or less than zero. These errors look heteroscedastic. If we drew a line through the middle of these points, the slope would be negative meaning that there is a negative correlation between the estimates of the dependent variable and the errors. If the errors were homoscedastic, there would be no correlation between the estimates of the dependent variable and the errors. If the errors are heteroscedastic, one way to deal with them is to add additional independent variables to your model. Additional independent variables may help the model make better estimates of the dependent variable because they add more information to the model. If the model makes better estimates, the variance of the error term might become more consistent across different values of observ or across different types of observations. For example, in the previous example, democracy score was the dependent variable and GDP per capita was the independent variable. It appeared based on the results that the errors were heteroscedastic. It is possible that the reason the errors were heteroscedastic is because I only included one independent variable in the model. There are other independent variables that can influence democracy level too. For example, ethnic fractionalization should have a negative impact on democracy level in a country a member of the EU should have a positive effect on democracy level. So I ran a multiple regression using democracy scores as a dependent variable and GDP per capita, ethnic fractionalization, and member of the EU as the independent variables. The results suggest that all of the independent variables impact the dependent variable in the way I expected. And the standardized errors appear to be less heteroscedastic than before. This is the histogram of the standardized errors in the bivariate regression. They are not normally distributed around zero. And this is the histogram of the standardized errors in the multiple regression. They appear to be closer to normally distributed around zero. The errors are more clustered around zero, and the distribu distribution looks more like a bell curve. And this is the scatter plot of the standardized errors and the standardized estimates in the bivariate regression. There appears to be a negative relationship between them. And this is the scatter plot of the standardized errors and the standardized estimates in the multiple regression. There appears to be less of a negative relationship between them, as in there likely is still a very small negative correlation, but is not as strong as it was before. 
As such, it appears that adding independent variables to the model will help improve the model. We can compare the R-square between both models too. As you can see, the R-square increases from 0.255 to 0.362. This suggests that adding additional independent variables improve the ability of the model to explain variations in the dependent variable. Another way to deal with heteroscedasticity is to consider whether one of the independent variables has a logged effect on the dependent variable. Perhaps the independent variable estimates a dependent variable better at lower values or higher values because the effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable changes across values of the independent variable. In order to address this possibility, you can log an independent variable you think has a logged effect on the dependent variable rerun the regression and see if the errors are more normally distributed after you log the independent variable. If you forgot how to run and interpret logged independent variables in regression, please revisit Lecture 7, Substantive Effects. So imagine I ran a model with life expectancy at birth as the dependent variable and GDP per capita as the independent variable. I expect GDP per per capita to have a positive effect on life expectancy at birth. I run the regression without logging GDP per capita. Here's the histogram of the standard errors of that regression. As you can see, the standardized errors are not normally distributed around zero. Then I ran the regression with the log GDP per capita variable. Recall To log a variable in SPSS, you click on Transform Compute. You put the variable name that you are creating in the target variable box. And then you put LN, open parentheses, in the numeric expression box. Then you put the variable you want to log over here in the numeric expression box. Then you close parentheses. Then you click OK. Then you do transform compute again. In the numeric expression box, you type in zero. Then you click if. Then you select include if case satisfies condition. Then you move the variable you want to log over to the box here. Type in equals zero. Click continue. Click OK. Click OK to change existing variable. Then you can go into SPSS and see if the variable was created at the end of the data view tab, which it was here. And then you can run your, your regression with your new variable. So I ran the regression with life expectancy at birth as the dependent variable and log GDP per capita as the independent variable. Here are the standardized errors of that regression. As you can see, the standardized errors are closer to be normally distributed around zero. Although it's clear that they are not perfectly normally distributed, they are closer than the errors were in the previous model. And here's the scatter plot of the standardized estimates and standardized errors from the model with the GDP per capita that is not logged. As you can see, there's a negative relationship between the standardized estimates and standardized errors. This suggests that the errors are heteroscedastic. And here's a scatter plot of the standardized estimates and standardized errors from the model with the log GDP per capita variable. As you can see, the negative relationship between the standardized estimates and the standardized errors has diminished. Although there is still a small negative relationship here, this model and this model could benefit from adding additional independent variables. It is clear that the, the errors are less heteroscedastic than before. We can also compare the R-square between both models. As you can see, the R-square increases from 0.363 to 0.585. This suggests that logging the independent variable improved the ability of the model to explain variations in the dependent variable. The next assumption we will talk about is the assumption of no multicollinearity.
With no multicollinearity, we assume that the independent variables are not related to each other. When we violate this assumption, we have multicollinearity in our models. That means our independent variables are correlated. When this, happen, when this happens, it is almost like we have the same independent variable twice in our model. As a result, we are less likely to get significant results. SPSS cannot tell which independent variable is influencing the dependent variable since they are so similar. For example, imagine we ran a model with democracy scores the dependent variable and GDP per capita and percent below the poverty line as the independent variables. I expect GDP per capita have a, to have a positive effect on democracy and poverty to have a negative effect on democracy. Here are the results of that regression. As you can see, the coefficient for GDP per capita is significant, but small. But the coefficient for percent below the poverty line is not significant. It is possible that the coefficient for percent below the poverty line is insignificant because it is correlated with GDP per capita. To find out, you can run a correlation analysis between your independent variables. To run a correlation analysis, click Analyze, Correlate by Variate. You put your independent variables in the, independent, in the variables box and click OK. To find the correlation coefficient, you look at the intersection of the Pearson correlation coefficient between two variables. Generally speaking, values less than negative 0 0.50 and greater than 0 0.50 indicate that the independent variables are correlated enough with another that you might have a multicollinearity problem. Here is the correlation coefficient between GDP per capita and percent of living below the poverty line. The correlation coefficient negative 0 0.570 is less than negative 0.5, which suggests that there is a high enough negative correlation between the two independent variables that you might have a multicollinearity problem. One very simple way to deal with multicollinearity is to run two separate regression models, one for each independent variable. I ran two models, one with GDP per capita as the independent variable and one with poverty as the independent variable. In both models, the coefficients are now significant, which support my original expectations. Next, the fourth assumption of ordinary least squares regression deals with time series models where we have multiple observations for our subjects over time. In these models, we assume that the error term is not correlated with time. Alternatively, we assume that the value of our dependent variable is in one time period is not correlated with the value of our dependent variable in the previous time period. When we violate this assumption, it is called autocorrelation. The error term is correlated with time. It is not random. This could lead to insignificant results for our coefficients. To illustrate how autocorrelation can be a problem, consider the following model. The dependent variable is abortion rates in the US from 1973 to 2000. So this is a time series data set. The independent variable is GDP per capita, expected to have a negative effect on abortion rates. I ran a regression using this data. Since it is a time series model, and I want to check for autocorrelation. I made sure when I ran my regression I clicked on save and selected save the unstandardized residuals. These are the results of the regression. 
I did not get the result I expected. The coefficient is insignificant. To determine if my model suffers from autocorrelation, I select, I select graphs, legacy dialogues, scatter dot. I select simple scatter and click define. I put the unstandardized, unstandardized residuals labeled RES1 in the y-axis box. I put the time variable in the x-axis box. In this case, it is year. Then I click OK. If you drew a line through the center of these scatter dots, the slope of the line should be flat or zero. If that is the case, there is no relationship be between the errors and time. If the, li if the line has a positive or negative slope, that means the errors are correlated with time. These errors do look positively correlated with time. As time increases, the errors get bigger. One way to address autocorrelation is to add a time count independent variable to your model. The variable starts at one for the first year or time unit and increases by one for each additional time unit. To do this, go into SPSS, click the variable view tab, name your time count variable and click on the data view tab. Then enter in one, two, three, etc. into the time count model. Then you can run your model with your main independent variable and your time count variable as an independent variable. Here are the results. The coefficient for the time count variable is significant. And now the coefficient for GDP per capita is negative and significant as I expected. Hence, it was important to control for time in this model to correctly ascertain whether GDP per capita actually had an influence on abortion rates. If the time count variable is significant, you can interpret the substantive effect of the variable this way. All else equal, as the time unit increases by one, the dependent variable changes by the value of B hat. Using the example as an illustration, we can say all else equal as the time count variable increases by one, abortion rate increases by 4.148. You can interpret the substantive effects of the other independent variables too if the coefficients for them are significant. Using our previous example as an illustration, you could say all else equal as GDP per capita increases by one, abortion rate decreases by 0 0.004.